Um, you don't have that. And then, yeah, most of them. So, a lot of the children are going to be out of the program. It's probably not that. Oh, yeah, that's fine. They'll have the graduate school to the ESPN. Including, like, actual graduate missions. We're going to have a lot of fun there. We're going to have a lot of fun there. Like, state government and nonprofit work. This guy here is a graduate of the Center for a consulting firm that works for Sing Robots. Uh, Kendra is a graduate who works for a national scale, like sustainable communities that profit. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's kind of like XML. Um, sometimes for a developer, I mean, more so for a consultant that works with partners, you know, like on the permitting side, right? Yeah, everybody. Should we wait a few minutes for council? Oh, yeah. Sure. Yeah, that's a good idea. Maybe we'll. Which is close. That's online. We're waiting for a few more moments before we begin. It was inspired by the. Uh, but she's. I think so. You guys have copies of the agenda on the sign in. Anybody? Ms. Grab and want to grab one for you. Thanks, everybody. We'll uh, get started. Thanks for joining us for our first zoning advisory committee for Richmond 300 Code Refresh, which is how we're branding the new zoning ordinance for Ray. Apologize for you guys sitting here. We were trying to squeeze a big crowd into one room. Future <laughs> meetings will probably be in a different location. Um, but uh, the meeting agenda, we're starting off with some. I'll just go over some brief organizational details, um, and then we'll have an opportunity for public comment for items not on the agenda for members of the public who want to share some information. And then our consultant team is going to take over and share some information about their plans and also our engagement um, strategy going. So first, in terms of introductions, again, I'm Mary Ann Pitts. I am a deputy director in the planning department. Myself, along with our team, is help with this process. We'll introduce everybody on our side in a second. But first, if the advisory council wants to go around, introduce themselves, um, share a little bit about the unique perspectives they're hoping to bring to the council. And we can start with Janice. first. Hello, everybody. My name is Janice Barrio. And what I bring to the table is making sure that everyone has an equitable voice in things that go on in the um, city of Richmond. I don't like to call them communities of concern, but maybe communities of opportunity. And so we help people in the East End of Richmond advocate for themselves, whether it's transportation or housing or different things like that. So that's what I bring. Hello, my name is Yanina James, and I serve as Outreach Director for the Life Church RVA. We are located in Spartan of Southside Richmond. Um, currently, we partner with local community organizations, businesses, and other ministries to help uh, combat different areas of insecurity within our community, which include food insecurity, educational equity, community empowerment, and family. Roger, you uh, started working for the 
department here in the early 70s. I was one of two people who was involved in finishing up the draft of the ordinance that was adopted in 76 and then subsequent mapping of that ordinance for the next two years and then literally hundreds of amendments that took place after that up until the early 2000s when I retired. I was before that I was secretary of the board of zoning appeal. After I retired, I was appointed to the zoning board, where I am still in a member. I was hired in the early 70s to replace someone who was involved in writing the 1927 zoning mm. who also worked on the 1919 interim zoning ordinance and the 1909 Chicago mm -hmm. Master Plan by Danny Byrne. Wow. So we have some continuity here. In the <laughs> I'm Dave Katanis, uh, I'm an architect in uh, Richmond for about 44 years, moved here from elsewhere, and I've uh, been on the Planning Commission, the Urban Design Committee, Commission of Architecture Review, uh, the Arts Commission, and uh, one other in there that I'm missing. Hello, I'm Danny Gates, I'm in third. Uh, Generation Richmonder, I'm a Chicago School graduate, and I'm a community health worker, um, professionally lay health promoter, uh, community wise, and I'm the Nancy Cancer Comprehensive Cancer Center in Champlain. So I do a lot of cancer research, anything dealing with food, uh, just anything in the community. I'm always there. Uh, my name is Bert Peck. I'm an architect in Richmond, Virginia. I've been here for a little over 30 years, I'm uh, one of the members of the Planning Commission elected to this committee. I'm Charlie Wilson. Uh, I am the Director of Permitting at Baker Development Resources, which is a local um, concierge firm that helps with miscellaneous permitting processes in the city of Richmond, both construction related and uh, special use permit, land use related items, I guess. Uh, I've got a work experience with uh, construction specifically and then pivoted into this role um, through big development resources and I have not one but two planning degrees. Um, <laughs> couldn't help myself, had to get a second. Uh, I got it at VCU specializing specifically in uh, zoning outreach and communities uh, in my professional plan. Hi, Maritza Peachin. I have lived in Richmond for almost 13 years, um, which is the longest I've ever lived anywhere in my life. I grew up in uh, Puerto Rico most of my life and well, except for now here. Um, I live in Northside Richmond with my kids and my husband and I work for the Build America Bureau, which is part of the US Department of Transportation. Um, it's, a, it's a bank that finances infrastructure. Um, but before that I worked for the city and I helped author the Richmond 300 master plan and get it through the process to get it approved. I'm Elizabeth Greenfield. Um, I'm a member of the Planning Commission, Lake Burt, but was appointed to serve on the advisory committee, and I work in government affairs and advocacy for the land development and home building industry. And I'm Ellen Robertson. I serve as the city six district city council representative. I've been on city council now for my 21st year. Um, I had lots of experience serving on lots of boards and commissions for the city, uh, including the planning commission, um, more than once. Um, so hats off to you guys for the great work that you are doing. Um, I'm here to represent city council. And so I hope to continue to bring the voices uh, of all nine members of council and keep them informed as to what we are uh, discussing and make sure that each one of the council members uh, provide me with leadership and guidance uh, so that I am not here just representing uh, the sixth district, which is the district that I serve, but on behalf of the entire city council body. Uh, my name is Eric Mai. I'm the uh, vice president at HD Advisors for uh, affordable housing and community development. Um, consulting firm based here in Richmond. Uh, in that role, I also serve uh, two nonprofits, 
Um, I'm the co-executive director for um, Housing for Virginia. Um, we're an affordable housing policy and research think tank. Um, we do work all across the state. Um, and I also, in that role, I also lead the Virginia Zoning Atlas Project, um, which is actually uh, analyzing and mapping all of the zoning districts uh, in the Commonwealth of Virginia to see how they zone or don't zone for housing. Uh, in my second role, I also serve as the director of acquisitions for Maggie Walker Community Land Trust. Um, we're an affordable home ownership nonprofit um, doing work here in the state of Richmond, as well as uh, Henrico and Chesterfield counties. Hi, I'm Damian Pitt. I'm a professor in the Urban and Regional Studies and Planning Program here at VCU. Been there for about 12 years. Uh, happy to see at least three of our graduates of our master's program here on the committee, maybe more, at least three that I know of. Um, and I, um, you know, prior, prior to getting to academia, I worked in, in planning in, in Oregon for, for a few years. So I've done um, various types of long range planning work, both sort of in, from a professional and a research uh, focus. Um, a lot of my research is in um, sort of how urban planning decisions affect um, energy use and environment. And so um, one of my other roles at BCU is I'm an associate director of the Institute for Sustainable Energy and Environment, which is a new interdisciplinary research center that we have over there. And also was on the Richmond 300 um, Advisory Commission with several of these fine folks here. Uh, my name is Preston Lloyd. I'm an attorney at the law firm of Williams Mullen, located downtown. I'm also a Richmond resident in Bird Park. Uh, my day job is helping property owners and developers understand how the Richmond zoning ordinance impacts their ability to either use their property or position it for uses that they hope to develop. And uh, in that capacity, work frequently with uh, housing developers, especially affordable housing, um, both nonprofit and um, non nonprofit developers and had the pleasure of working with uh, Damien and others on the Richmond 300 advisory councils as well. I'm Philip Hart, uh, another lawyer. Um, I'm a lifelong Richmonder. I work at Genworth Financial and do, among other things, all of our facilities real estate work, which led me a couple of years ago to uh, work closely with the county of Henrico. Our main campus is located right across the city line of the county. Uh, when they were going through, when Henrico was going through its recodification of uh, the zoning ordinance, and we worked with its consultant. So it was interesting working from the perspective of a large property owner with the county. Uh, a few years after that, I got involved with the West Hampton Citizens Association. I'm the immediate past president, and in that role, uh, was involved as observer and commenter. Uh, during the Richmond 300 process. So, uh, whereas in my professional life, I pr approached uh, some of these things from the large corporate owner standpoint, uh, through civic involvement, I'm really interested in the impact of uh, development and zoning on neighborhoods. And um, so, uh, but we'll sort of have that viewpoint as well as we go through this process. Looking forward to working with all of you. My name's Michelle Parrish, and I own a small business in Churchill. We've been open since 2018. It's called Soul and Vinegar. It's a restaurant and catering business, and we're in Churchill North, um, which is closer to Nine Mile. And I have seen a lot of Richmond's growth um, since we've been open, and I've seen and had to deal with a lot of the positive and negative effects of Richmond's growth and development. And I I'm here to learn and see if I can potentially be part of the solution to offer more opportunities to everybody in the city. Hey everybody, my name is Casey Overton. I use she they pronouns. Um, similar to Michelle, I am not a small business owner, but I do live in Church Hill. I've worked with Chat Now Rise. I've worked with Richmonders involved to strengthen our community's risk. Um, and I do a lot of work within faith nonprofit space. Um, yeah, and I've kind of seen Richmond beginning to change. Um, I've grown up in the Richmond area, the greater Richmond area, mostly in Prince George County for my most of my life. Um, and so, yeah, similarly, just want to be a part of change. I have an eye towards justice and eye towards vulnerable populations that I've been connected to in the city um, and wanting this process to be a part of positive change. 
Good afternoon, everybody. I am Dr. Wayne Cradle. I have been in Richmond since 2016 now. I'm originally from uh, Norfolk, Virginia. I own my own company, Cradle LLC, where I provide organization development and consulting for small businesses, for nonprofits, and for churches. Um, I'm also in the ministry as well, and I'm also a professor at Regent University, where I also, where I also received my PhD in uh, org leadership. And so at Regent, I teach in the Department of uh, Counseling. And so I am so excited to be here with all of you all. Thank you all for having me. I'm here to uh, be a voice. I'm here to learn and grow and to work, to work with all of you. So thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Kendra Norrell. Sorry, I'm late. Um, and I am an expert student at VCU. I've also participated on the Richmond 300 Advisory Council. I've worked with the City of Richmond's Office of Sustainability for RBA Green 2050. Um, and I am focused, my professional focus is in environmental planning and environmental funding. Um, so I'm really excited to bring that in as, as well. Here we have one. Um, Jennifer is online. Jennifer, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes, thank you. I'm sorry I can't be there in person. I'm on the way to a hearing, so appreciate the team's link. I'm Jennifer Mullen. I'm also a lawyer in town um, and live in the offices in Scott's Edition. Um, I also served on the Richmond 300. Um, and I do represent uh, developers in multiple capacities um, and have spent a lot of time looking at both the city's zoning ordinance as well as surrounding locality zoning ordinances. So look forward to, to working with you all to, to help make uh, the Richmond recodification the best it can be. Thank you. And thank you all for volunteering your time to join us on this number. We appreciate it. Yeah, very quickly, uh, you all should have received copies in an email of the bylaws. If you need a copy, we have some available over here. So pass those around uh, of our bylaws. Just to go over how this project is being managed. So this is, and I apologize for you all trying to use this kind of map, but this is a, a planning commission initiative. Under that, the advisory council is an ad hoc committee of planning commission that is advising planning commission. Staff on the planning department is uh, working on this project and helping management. The director, Kevin Bonk, unfortunately, is out of town. It's going out of town right at this moment. It's on a plane or else he'd be with us. But the policy and planning team is helping the director on this initiative. So myself, Mary Ann Pitts, we have Samantha Lewis helping pass around the bylaws. Luan Neal, who's sitting in the back. Um, Erica Banks is online, and we also have Brian Mercer online, but he is not working because he's on parental leave right now, but he is permitting us as a citizen part of this. In addition to all that, all the different uh, divisions of the planning department are helping advise. Underneath that, we do have a consultant team that you'll meet later on in the agenda. Code Studio is the lead consultant team. Uh, Brick and Story is providing their engagement work and Utio, which I probably mispronounced because I keep pronouncing it all different ways, is also helping on the project and they have some other stuff. Consultants, they'll share with you that later on in the agenda. In terms of the bylaws, uh, probably one of the more important things this is an advisory commission. So we're not making decisions as this body, we're coming up with advice to share with the planning commission, who will be a further advising uh, the council as to what the decision should be made in regards to the rewrite. So our, our goal is for you to provide your advice on the thought of the technical work that we're doing, really raise any red flags, maybe. Um, we can deal with a lot of the specific wording internally and work on that, but really wanting a body that can raise red flags of things that we've overlooked or the, that um, need further detail or deeper dive on. Well, also helping with engagement, um, reaching people in different communities and making sure we're connecting with all the right uh, people. You'll see those in the bylaws. We've set the meetings the second Wednesday of the month, four to six. Um, we we're looking for a venue that works good for both virtual in person, which is a little bit more difficult in some city buildings. And as you can see in here, we're kind of oddly configured. Plan RBA has offered their boardroom. They're off Hull Street in Manchester. There's an adjacent parking garage that we can work with. So it's going to be a little bit easier um, and it works for both in person and virtual meetings. So we're looking forward to having future meetings at that location. So it's easier for people to get to. That's a by bus line as well. 
Um, the council does have the ability to create working groups. The thought is as we go a little bit deeper in the process that we can create working groups on specific topics. They may just meet one time or multiple times. It's up to the council to look at the need for uh, the use of working groups. That's the way the bylaws as well. It will, we will be led by a chair and a vice chair. So you'll see later in the agenda that uh, hopefully we'll be nominating and appointing those positions to last for the length of this project. So sorry. thank you, Michelle. Um, Attendance requirements are modeled after planning commission. Um, so please don't miss more than four consecutive meetings. Uh, we're, we're only missing meeting once a month. So hopefully that doesn't occur. We've added some guidelines about electronic participation. Again, these are based on the procedures of the planning commission um, where you notify the chair and then the body will vote on the acceptance of the electronic participation. I'm reaching out to the city attorney to see if we need to be as detailed as this advisory body and see if we might. So there might be some modifications to that section as a part of uh, I'll bring them back to the council at the next meeting. That's kind of an overview of a lot within the bylaws. If you have any questions uh, about that, we also have the ground rules as a part of the bylaws as well, engaging in this open dialogue, participating as an individuals, but if you are representing the entire council body, if you can share with us that who you're representing when you're speaking for a larger group of people. Um, when you're out in public, if you can just refrain from speaking on behalf of the council. Our goal is for you to attend all meetings, preferably in person if you're available, just to, for easier and better conversation and to read all materials beforehand. Uh, we want everyone to participate in the conversation and to share their advice. It's the point of uh, this diverse body of people being here and um, try to allow time for others to speak. So those are the ground rules. They're the same ones from Richmond 300 Advisory Committee. So if you were a part of that process, we're operating under these same ground rules so we can work together. Um, in terms of the Freedom of Information Act, which is the, um, how we share information, the transparency that we're, we need to operate under, the main thing is if you're meeting more than three, if you can uh, of you in a body, to let us know when we can advertise that as a meeting. If you're meaning to discuss the business of the advisory council, we're operating under FOIA the same way any other public body will operate. Most of what um, is discussed here is things that I will be doing or Sam will be doing, making sure the meetings are posted. All information will be on the planning department website, sharing that information as well. If you receive a request for information, whether in writing or in person or anything, we would treat that as uh, request for information through the Freedom of Information Act. If you can email there, it's a pdr.foia at rva.gov, or you can just email any of us on staff and we can um, make sure it gets to the right people and we process that request at the right time. That is a very quick overview of how we bought the bylaws and also of how this falls. Yes. I, not seeing a representative of the city attorney's office here, I don't think. Somebody can jump in if they are online, but it may be worth just highlighting the applicable version or provision of the electronic meeting requirement. If you can't be here in person, you have to notify the chair, and then the chair would hold a vote as part of the meeting to allow the person to participate electronically due to a personal matter that prevents you being here. And then once that vote occurs, you get to participate. So just kind of, I think, good for everybody to know what that process entails. So if there's any misunderstanding. And it's on if you. Take a look at the bylaws. Um, it's it's but um, uh, section five, part D is just a process. Sir. Um, a couple of things that got posted were some sort of peripheral meetings that I guess seen to the general public zoning seminar on the 24th, 25th, and another meeting on July 11th. And neither one says. Oh, okay. So those two. We'll get to those events. Uh, it'll be coming up when, uh, when our engagement consultants have a chance so to speak. Yeah, so. We have not, though, on the 24th and the 25th, as part of the initial rollout, we're doing a webinar. So those will be online meetings. We're just working through whether we schedule those on Teams or on Zoom platform, trying to figure out. And then those links will be shared with everybody, probably this just sorry, further as an organizational matter, after we appoint a chair and a vice chair, we do need to vote to adopt. I don't see that on the agenda. So just wanted to make sure we didn't look past yeah, that. Yeah, it's 
It's a modern desk. Thank you. It sounds like somebody who presides over me. Uh, considering people to nominate. Great. So next, I think that does lead us into the election of officers. Do need a chair and a vice chair. Anybody? Of course, Robertson. Is the process just to nominate someone? Yes. Uh, yes. So I, I, I think it's very important that the chair of this body be um, one of our representatives that are serving with us with the planning commission is in as much that our advice is going back to the planning commission. And uh, I would like to ask uh, Ms. Greenfield if she would be willing to consider um, the nomination for chair. I would be honored. I Wonderful. second that nomination or whatever. That's a thing. <laughs> We have a motion and a second from Greenfield Chair. Uh, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Do uh, we have any nominations for the vice chair? I mean, I'm inclined to invite my colleague from the Planning Commissioner, Mr. Pinnock, but I don't know that he wants to take that on right now. <laughs> I can see from the shock <laughs> of his face. <laughs> Mr. Lord, would you be interested? <laughs> I'd be honored to serve as well. Oh, so wow. I'd like to nominate the second. Being the vice chair of the council, uh, all those in favor. Aye. Uh, chair and a vice chair. Do we want to? Uh, so then, may I move back to my seat? <laughs> <laughs> I love sitting next to you, but I like to have a well, chair. Yeah. I chair up at the top of the table. Um, you want to go back no. to uh, Hudson's question? Do we have a motion to approve the bylaws? So move to approve the bylaws with the consent. Motion and a second to approve the bylaws as presented. All those in favor? You all. Well, that was um, just the brief introduction of the organizational matters. I am going to now hand it over to the public. We have our actually, Ms. Greenfield, if you want to continue with the agenda, uh, we have public comment. <laughs> Easy on my job. Yeah. <laughs> Don't go far. I'm just kidding. Um, do we have anyone uh, that would like to offer public comment at this time um, in person and virtually? So we'll start with in person first. Since you raised your hand, you could come to the podium and um, offer your name, please. All right. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Richard Hankins. I'm the executive director of the Partnership for Smarter Growth. And first, I want to extend my congratulations to each and every member of this council as Richmond embarks on this historic process aimed at enhancing our city's prosperity and community vitality. Um, at PSG, we advocate for zoning initiatives that are aligned with the principles of smart growth. Uh, these can include mixing land uses, embracing compact building design, creating walkable neighborhoods, promoting infill development, fostering distinct attractive communities with a strong sense of place and encouraging community collaboration. Uh, we urge the council uh, to consider these smart growth principles throughout the rewrite. We also ask for close attention on how we can incentivize affordable mixed income housing and bicycle and pedestrian improvements around these new developments. Um, by integrating idea, these ideas, we can promote greater equity, reduce carbon emissions, strengthen community cohesion, and address our escalating housing crisis. Uh, we envision a Richmond where Every citizen has the opportunity to live in an affordable, convenient, safe, and beautiful environment. Uh, thank you. Thank you. We have additional speakers? Yes. Hello, everyone. My name is LeGrand Northcutt. Um, I see my councilwoman, Helen Robertson, and neighbors here. Uh, and thank you all for your service here. Uh, I just want to bring something to y'all's attention. Uh, I am on the board of Urban Hope, which is a uh, nonprofit affordable housing provider in the East End. And one of the things that we have seen over the past couple of years is up to a 50% year over year increase in our property tax bills. Uh, this is the area of the East End that is 
gentrifying, and I'd use that term kind of neutrally, um, and developing. And I think it goes without saying the way that the land is zoned, a property is zoned, directly affects its value. So as y'all are considering some of these zoning implications for some of these neighborhoods where property taxes and values are already increasing, uh, I ask that you be mindful of the fact that that could create even more problems for not only residents who are paying property tax bills, but nonprofit and affordable housing developers who are paying those property tax bills. Um, so just a recurring issue, especially in the East End, possibly other areas of the city that I'm not as familiar with. I just want to bring that to all's attention. So thank you all. Thank you. We have anybody else in the audience that would like to offer comment? Is there anybody online behind me like they can hear me? Any hands raised? I guess since there's an opportunity, I will offer public comment. Joe Galbach with the Richmond Association of Realtors. And uh, I'm sure a lot of people get here, tired of hearing me say, you know, Richmond Metro region is adding 28 people a day net. Um, and so as we go forward throughout this um, rezoning process, I'd like people to just kind of keep in mind that, you know, we are going to continue to grow. Um, it's a good thing, um, but we have to manage what that growth looks like, how it feels, um, who can afford to live here, who can't. Um, and what opportunities are presented to both today's residents, but tomorrow's residents. Um, and keep in mind too, that uh, a lot of our housing and the lack of supply that we're seeing um, currently in the city of Richmond, now the new stats have just come out, so I don't have them off the top of my head yet. Um, we have less than a month of supply inventory of resale housing. Um, and what that means is essentially, if we were to stop listing homes today, uh, all of the for sale homes would be absorbed in under a month. Um, that's how strong our demand is. So um, I hope to be a collaborative part of this process um, and just kind of would encourage folks to uh, think about the fact that we're gonna continue to grow and we need to figure out how to accommodate that growth. Um, because once supply and demand becomes seriously imbalanced, we start to see the affordability crisis that we're in right now. So look forward to working with you all and thank you. More calls for anybody online? Would like to offer comment online, just um, raise your hand. Okay. Oh. It's just a moment. We're going to unmute you, Christian. Yeah. Yeah. So, or Chris. It was Christian. Yeah. Can you hear me? You can. OK, cool. Yeah, so um, my name is Christian Schick. Uh, I'm from the Strong Towns RVA uh, Civic uh, Involvement Group. And uh, I just wanted to give a comment uh, similar to what many have said here today, uh, just that as a ordinary citizen, not with too much technical expertise, when I read the, uh, the zoning laws, I see a lot of uh, implications on growth, uh, similar to what many others have said here, that I do uh, hope to see us uh, be able to set Richmond up for better growth in the future. Um, and yeah, uh, very similar to what others have said. So thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. Sir, you're welcome to come forward. Hi, my name is uh, Chris Marapatsos. Uh, we are developers in the area and uh, owners, I also live in the FAND. I uh, want to thank everyone for being progressive on uh, uh, seeing Richmond grow in a, in a great way. Um, thank you so much. Um, and I just want to point out that we have some properties in the BUU Chamberlain area. Uh, we were the, one of the first to rezone in that area to TOD1. Some of you were ones that approved that. We thank you guys. Um, looking in the agenda, I did not see, um, or it, I definitely saw that area into the agenda. I just want to, we can, uh, you know, I not only we have interest there, but it's it's a two three two two zero zip code. It's right in the center of the city, and it needs some love and attention. That specific area, there's so much opportunity to be had there. We're investing there. We'd love for for 
developers outside of the city to see it as well. You guys have started um, that progress. We just are, are, are helping push it. Um, I just would love to see that area be inclusive in the overall zoning of Richmond 300. I don't think, uh, I know there was a, a plan that was put forth, a master plan in 2018. There was one also done in 2001 in 1998. Um, could be off on the dates, but I would, you know, if there's anything that we can do to be uh, helpful in that scenario, we have about nine or 10 properties in that area, all accumulated in the last three years. So um, we're long-term, we have long-term interests, not short-term. Um, so if I can be helpful, um, uh, we're here in support and uh, with our resources. So thank you for everything that you're doing. And I just wanted to put focus in that specific uh, parcel. Thank you. Anybody else online? Last call for public comment. Thank you, everyone. Um, so we'll move to the next part of our agenda, which is presentations and discussions. Um, I think we're going to hear from our consultants at this time. Just give me a second here. I'm about to share my screen. Are you guys able to see my screen and hear me? Yes. 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 Excellent. Uh, okay. So, oops. Can you hear me all right? Yeah. We're we're just going to turn it up on our end a little bit. Sure. Bear with us for just a second. No worries. Okay. Okay. All good. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna give you a very short presentation. I'll introduce um, our team uh, and talk a little bit about what we're doing. Um, this is a very similar presentation to the one that we gave to the Planning Commission about a month ago. Um, and then we're going to um, have our, um, our engagement consultants give a, a, an additional presentation about the engagement plan for the project. And then we can have um, a little bit of a formal discussion at the end. We've got a few questions for you and um, we're obviously open to answering any questions you may have for us. Um, so what are we doing with this project? Um, just very broadly, um, we're, we're hoping to align the zoning ordinance with Richmond 300. Um, we know that Richmond 300 was, was approved, um, it, has, it was relatively recently uh, put together and represents the, the vision for the, for the future of the community. Um, it's um, the, the current zoning ordinance is, is, is in a number of ways not aligned to the goals of Richmond 300. Um, and just you know, at the very high level, that's gonna include issues of efficient land use, housing options and affordability, um, creating mixed use walkable neighborhoods and preservation of character and history of natural resources in the city. Um, we're also looking to create a, a more modern code. We know that the, the, the current code was, was, has essentially not been updated substantially since 1976. Um, so we're looking to bring that into the 20th, 21st century. So we're looking to produce a code that's gonna be easy to, to use and administer as well. Um, you know, we're viewing the current code in detail. It's, it's quite confusing in a number of ways. It's tough for staff, but it's also tough for members of the public and even developers to really understand um, how it works in certain ways. Um, the team that we're going to bring um, is led by Code Studio. So we've got on the call today Colin Scarf, who's um, a partner with our firm. Um, he's going to be overseeing the project. Um, my name is Renee Bieberstein. I'm the project manager. Um, I'm also an associate principal with Code Studio. Um, I'll be the primary day-to-day -day contact for the project team and overseeing coordination of meetings and whatnot. Uh, we're also being supported by Kelsey Morrow, who's here from Code Studio, um, helping us out. Um, Code Studio is being supported by a number of other firms uh, who you heard introduced um, earlier in the first presentation. Um, UTL, led by Matthew Littell. Um, it's a firm out of Boston. They're going to be working on the pattern book component um, of this project, which is really a study into the traditional neighborhood forms and architectural forms of Richmond that is going to help inform the zoning work uh, by Brick and Story, um, who will be presenting uh, just after us, uh, dealing with engagement. Um, and so all the kind of public meetings um, and stakeholder meetings that we're going to set up are going to be arranged through Brick and Story. Um, we have a few other firms outside of the core team who are going to be supporting us and kind of coming in when necessary. So that includes um, Grove Slade dealing with um, auto transportation, Foursquare, dealing with multimodal transportation, RKG, 
um, for Renee, economics. Renee, could you Renee. pause for just a second? I apologize yeah. for interrupting you. Um, if you're giving the same presentation you gave to the Planning Commission, um, I believe you have slides, and we're still seeing just oh, your first you're, one. you're still seeing the first one. Oh no! Okay, that's terrible. Let me go back again. Thank you. I'm so sorry, guys. Um, it's okay. So, Thank sorry, you. I sorry, I should have checked. I don't know what what that happens. Can you guys see different slides now or no? Yeah. 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 So maybe it was the full screen thing that wasn't working. I'm sorry. So let me sorry just. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah. No, I'm so sorry. Thank you for telling me that. Um, let me just go back again quickly, and I'm sorry um, to to do that. But um, project goals. Um, these are the ones that I went through just a second ago. Let me just say, just broadly, in reviewing Richmond 300, there is probably um, over 100 um, individual tasks um, that are in that, that plan that affect the code that we've identified so far. So we're gonna be going through all those in detail and, and aligning our work to try to follow that lead. Um, but these are just a few kind of really kind of high level um, uh, goals that we kind of uh, took from that. Um, and creating a modern code, which I just mentioned to you guys about. So sorry to have to go over this again, but these are sort of very high level trying to align the, the work of the code to Richmond 300 and um, and trying to bring the code up to speed uh, to the 21st century. The, the team here, sorry, I'll just say again, Colin Scarf, uh, just to put some, some names, uh, some faces to names here. Uh, Colin's on the call today. Um, next time we're in town, uh, we'll be meeting with you guys in person. So. Uh, this will all be a lot, a lot easier, <laughs> um, but you'll be able to meet Colin and myself um, um, and uh, being also supported here by Kelsey on the right-hand side. And uh, sorry to the rest of the team here, um, UTL, that's Matthew Littell, who's the, the leader for uh, for UTL. Um, uh, Brick and Story being led by Latoya Thomas. We also have Emily McKnight on the call today from Brick and Story. And then the other firms, and I was just saying Grow Slade, Foursquare, um, RKG, and uh, Harold and Chambliss uh, for legal support. Um, so, sorry guys, uh, we'll continue on from here. So just to give you a really quick introduction to Code Studio, um, our firm was founded in 2006. Um, we believe that right-sizing codes and plans requires a really deep understanding of each, of each community's character. Uh, we work on plans and codes that yield vibrant, uh, mixed-use, walkable communities uh, through creative urban infill and redevelopment strategies. And we're a leader in the preparation of adoptable, easy to understand and highly visual development codes um, that apply award-winning innovation and a unique approach to each community. Um, so just a few kind of stats about some of the work that Code Studio has done over the years. Um, we've uh, we've done 111 and counting total projects. Um, those include a large number of codes, um, both overall unified development codes and individual um, uh, subdivision codes. Um, we've also done plans. We do a certain amount of, of planning as well. Um, we've got um, offices and remote individuals working across the country and a little bit beyond. Um, and uh, approximately 10 employees. Um, our codes have happened kind of all across the country, so covering 33 different states, uh, including the state of Virginia, of course, already. Um, some of the recent work that we've done that's probably most relevant to, to Richmond is some of our work in Charlottesville. Um, so uh, that began with a, real, with a deep analysis of the current regulations that they had there and identification of, of barriers, um, testing of metrics, and um, summarizing what the new regulations and approaches might be. It turned into a code in the end after that analysis, uh, which was, I think, a, a good example of the code work that we do. It's modern, it's simple, it's graphic, um, and it implements, um, similar to what we're doing in Richmond, implements a, a recently approved um, plan uh, that Charlottesville had in place. And it was adopted uh, right around the end of last year. So we're, we're really happy to see that. Um, so in terms of the work that we're going to be doing with, with you guys, um, so this is the very first phase of the project. This is already complete. This was just sort of getting kind of things lined up in the background, um, phase one. So from February to May of this year is essentially when it ran. We work with staff to confirm the timeline, um, uh, put together the engagement plan that you'll hear more about in a few minutes, uh, review the existing materials from the background that staff provided us with, did a kind of a kickoff visit, like an, in, an internal kickoff visit with staff. Um, and uh, we're looking forward to uh, doing a more of a public facing kickoff visit the next time we come, uh, including meeting with you guys. We're now really at the beginning of um, what is now kind of phases two, three, and four happening at the same time um, over the period of May to October, 2024. Um, so within those phases, there's, there's sort of three different uh, kind of elements to them. One of them is the preparation of the pattern book, uh, which is being done by UTL. 
Um, so that's really, like I said, a kind of a deep dive into the, kind of the physical um, uh, fabric of, of Richmond, uh, uh, both how it exists today and what its history was, uh, going down to the level of architecture as well, uh, and just trying to kind of really understand that. Um, and I'll, I'll talk to you in a moment about why we think that's especially important. Um, the next part is the zoning ordinance framework, which, which is really in a, sort of a deep analysis into the existing ordinance. And then the the district, uh, the zoning district framework, which is a kind of a conceptual outline of what we're going to be proposing. So uh, kind of the overall structure of the zoning code and a conceptual idea of what the districts might be going forward. Uh, but we won't yet be addressing the really detailed metrics, which will be the largest part of the project, getting into all those specific measurements um, and use uh, use sets associated with uh, with the new code. During this period, we're going to have three major engagement touch points. So essentially, July, August, and September, uh, we're going to be coming and and speaking to lots of people, including you guys again. Um, a sort of a bit of a sort of side piece coming out of this period um, will be an update to the existing ordinance, which is um, a, a sort of a temporary measure that staff have asked to do. So they're going to be taking some of the metrics that come out of the pattern book um, and doing a, a, a kind of a quick fix to the existing ordinance uh, to bring it better in alignment to the existing forms in some neighborhoods. Um, and that's because some of the, the, the zoning that's in place right now is, is highly misaligned with the traditional fabric of those neighborhoods and is requiring a lot of special use permits and other types of changes, um, essentially just to build the same type of uh, form that's already there. Um, so it's a, a bit of a side piece that, that staff will be leading uh, based out of some of the, the research from the pattern book. And then the, the final period, which is the longest period, uh, phase five, will be the, the draft and then the final zoning ordinance preparation. So I'll be working through all the testing of the code metrics, the graphics, the administrative language, um, going through all the different districts in, in great detail. And we have over a year to do that period. There'll be a number of engagements uh, during that period. So just a few uh, initial takeaways from our first trip to Richmond, and this was just uh, when we met with staff and, and, and took a look at the city. Some of us weren't that familiar with Richmond physically, so it was our, our first time. We were kind of um, fresh eyes in the city. Um, a few big things that 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 you know really jumped at us, and again, you know, we're going to be asking you some discussion questions. So if you see something that's missing here, we uh, definitely would like to hear your thoughts on additional additional things we should be paying attention to, but. Um, a few big initial observations that we're seeing that Richmond is, is obviously seeing a lot of growth. Um, that's generally speaking great news, but there's obviously big challenges with that as well, especially when it comes to affordability. We heard a lot about, um, about uh, the crisis that Richmond is facing with, with housing affordability and availability. Um, that being said, I would say we, we work with a lot of different municipalities that are in a different position where they're really just you know desperately trying to stimulate growth. and it's probably better to be in a condition where you're where you're seeing something and you're able to try and sculpt and channelize it than when it's in a condition where you're you're desperately trying to do whatever you can to to, to stimulate that growth. Um, but I certainly understand the challenges that come with it as well. Um, the current ordinance, um, as I was sort of getting at, is is imposing suburban standards that can't accommodate traditional neighborhood forms. Um, that's something that staff have told us a lot about. Um, it's a bit crude in a number of ways. It's not quite aligned to some of the, the traditional forms of Richmond. And so even though we may want to debate, you know, increasing intensity beyond those, those traditional forms in some areas, in a lot of ways, the, the code is, is sort of a step behind that. So it's not even really um, accepting what's there right now. So thinking about ways we can at the very least bring the code up to date with, with the existing fabric of the city um, is, uh, is an important thing. Um, we've seen related to that reliance on special use permits or SUPs um, to uh, try to approve um, things that um, are not in conformity with the code. Um, in some cases, those may always be a reality, but there's a, a large number of them that are happening right now. And we've heard from a number of different staff, and these are sort of gumming up the approvals process. They're taking a lot of time. In a lot of cases, they're things that are really, again, just about traditional fabric that, that was there. So you're essentially having to get a special use permit to build something that looks just like your neighbors in some cases. Um, the current ordinance is also a product of, of incremental changes. And for that reason, it can be quite confusing and inconsistent in terms of its naming of different districts, the types of metrics that it uses, and how it's actually applied on the map. So you know all these sort of things, because they were done in little bits at a time, there isn't necessarily an overall logic to them anymore. Um, and uh, just that inconsistency can be very confusing and, and not necessarily logical. So kind of taking a big, big step of step back and looking at the big picture and trying to kind of 
clean things up so that it makes more sense um, will be something that we'll be looking at doing. Um, and then finally, I would say that Richmond is, is ready for change. Um, I think that we're really excited by how excited that we've, uh, how much excitement we've heard from um, everybody we've spoken to so far in terms of staff um, and um, uh, other uh, agencies that were involved in our first visit. Um, uh, everybody seems really, really excited. Um, it seems like there's a lot of excitement around Richmond 300. Um, we're pretty happy with what we've seen from Richmond 300. We've actually used that as a precedent for some other planning work we've done in other cities. Um, so um, it seems like, like Richmond's in a really good position right now in terms of being ready to make this big change and uh, to revisit or to refresh uh, its zoning ordinance. Um, so with that, um, I would uh, turn it over after this to Brick and Story to talk about engagement. And then we can have um, some discussion um, after that and happy again to answer any of your questions at that point. Great, thank you, Renee. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, give me one moment, I will share my screen as well. Actually, since you can see our faces better, maybe I'll do this first. Um, principal and founder of Brick and Story, I'm Latoya Thomas. Very happy to be with all of you this evening. I'm joined tonight by my colleagues, Emily McKnight, who's our project manager and Manishka Javeri, who will be the assistant project manager on this project. I'm gonna walk us through a brief presentation so that you learn a little bit more about our firm, how we work. And we also are gonna dive into a presentation to walk you through some of the highlights of the actual engagement strategy that we've shared with the city. After that, as Renee mentioned, we're gonna go into a facilitated conversation um, on both some of the questions and points that Renee raised, as well as some stakeholder mapping that we've started to do and that we'd like your assistance with. And Emily and Manishka will um, facilitate that portion. So if you give me one moment. Okay, can I get, actually Renee, can I get a thumbs up? I can, that you can see my screen because I can see your face. Um, I can see your screen. Um, let's just make sure that we can see the next slide when you, when you move to it. Sure. Yes, slides changing. Yes. Great, uh, thank yeah. you. Okay, um, so again, um, we'll be presenting the engagement strategy and our stakeholder mapping um, exercise as part of our facilitate discussion. Um, quick overview about who we are. Um, so again, I'm Latoya Thomas, principal and founder of Brick and Story. We are a urban planning consultancy focused on stakeholder engagement in the built environment space. Um, I founded the company seven and a half years ago with a very specific focus on trying to bridge the divide between people and place. Um, and trying to uh, really create um, spaces of conversation and dialogue around how our built environment is shaped with a particular focus on trying to ensure that we are making the space and creating the pathways to elevate voices that have historically not been at the table um, as we have designed and developed our built environment. We work with a wide range of clients, including government agencies, um, other consultants like Code Studio, um, and we, we work up and down the East Coast. We are based in DC, but um, the bulk of our portfolio, aside from the immediate DMV area, also goes all the way down to North Carolina. Um, we also have uh, several projects going on in Charlottesville right now. We were part of the uh, Charlottesville Comp Plan and Zoning Code Update project with Code Studio for about four years. Um, and we've had work all the way up to New York City and out to West Virginia. So. Um, we are a small but mighty team of about 11, um, but have a pretty broad reach um, and work on a wide range of projects, including projects related to urban planning, transportation, environmental sustainability, um, economic development, housing, and beyond. And again, you've met our team earlier. This is going to be the primary team that you see as part of our project. We also have other team members that we will engage as needed. Um, as we move throughout the process. Um, we also have partnered um, with um, another woman-owned engagement consulting firm um, based in Virginia, Avid Core. Um, they will also be supporting us um, with any additional on-the-ground capacity that we might need for specific events as we move throughout um, the next two years of this project. So I'd like to dive in on the engagement strategy. So um, we've thought really intentionally around um, what we think is needed, particularly to get through this first phase of the process or first set of phases, which will take us through the end of the year. Um, and also thinking about some of our own experiences working on other projects and some of the challenges that we've seen. Um, so this strategy tries to speak to where we see opportunities to engage um, and how we would like to do that. 
So as we think about the reach of engagement, it's obviously in incredibly important that we're reaching out to as many people as possible and hearing from as many people um, as possible as part of this process. Um, we know Richmond 300 was an incredibly successful process. Um, that said, we do know that there were some groups that were underrepresented. And so thinking through even more creatively how we can try to close gaps in those in engagement, particularly around an issue um, as sensitive as zoning um, is critical to this process. Um, and while the entire city is um, a collective group of stakeholders for this process, we've tried to also highlight a number of targeted groups um, based on what we know about the demographics um, of Richmond, as well as who may have been underrepresented in the last process um, to elevate as part of this conversation. Um, these are just a few, and as we go through our stakeholder mapping, um, you'll be able to also comment on additional folks that might be missing. So Renee mentioned, I'll quickly go over, we've got um, four initial stages of engagement to get us through the end of the year. Um, we've wrapped up the project initiation stage. We've moved into the pattern book, um, frameworks for new zoning ordinance and new zoning districts, and then um, phase five, which is the development of the draft and final zoning ordinance. So just to walk through those phases very quickly, phase one, which we've completed between April and May, this is really around developing the framework for engagement. So developing our roadmap to get us out the gate for the next several months. Some of our key activities as part of this process have been obviously drafting an engagement strategy, um, de developing a framework for community volunteers ambassadors. We're not gonna do a deep dive on that this evening because we are trying to finalize some of that framework with the city, but probably in time for our next meeting with you, we'll talk through what that program looks like, but that's really a way to also allow community members who want to be more involved um, to be able to be part of the process in a volunteer capacity and I'll say in a paid volunteer capacity. Um, launching the project website, which we've supported the city in doing. Um, again, the engagement strategy, developing that and refining that and, and using these early meetings even with you tonight to help refine that. And then stakeholder mapping. So make sure that we know who's in the ecosystem that we're working in and making sure that we know all of the different networks that might exist, communication networks, partner networks, in order to get to those people so that they're getting information about this process and so that we're creating spaces for them to provide their input. So phases two to four, um, which is a pretty big chunk of this process, runs from June to October. Um, touch point one, um, which were some of the dates that someone um, in the committee had asked about the start of the meeting. Um, so as we think about this first touch point, um, which is really the project kickoff, we know that zoning is not always the most easily understood or digestible um, topic. It is also not always the most interesting, depending on how it's presented. Um, and so I want to be very transparent about that. But we think it's, number one, really important to make sure before we start rolling out with drafts of any documents um, that people really understand what zoning is. They understand what it is, they understand what it means for their neighborhoods and for their community. We also think it's really important for folks to understand what zoning has meant historically um, and how historic zoning and land use policies have actually shaped the Richmond that you all know today. And in many respects have, have um, shaped many of the divisions that you see within Richmond and even some of the growth challenges that you see right now. So as part of this first touch point, um, we propose a series of kickoff events. So as was mentioned earlier by Marianne, um, Zoning 101, two webinars um, that would, um, one being offered in the afternoon, one being offered in the evening time, um, but that would basically give folks an, a basic understanding of what zoning is, um, how it works, what it does, what it means, and why it's critical to um, this next stage of the Richmond 300 process. From there, we really want to orient everyone to a conversation around um, what zoning has meant for Richmond and also really what zoning has meant in the US. And what does that framing also mean for how we move forward through this process together? Um, for those of you who are versed in land use policy and in zoning, um, I don't have to tell you that uh, zoning historically in the US, um, while it has, yes, created frameworks around which we built our neighborhoods, it has also been used as a tool to divide communities. It's been used as a tool to segregate. Um, it has been used as a tool to exclude. And it's really important for people before they are able to provide really quality feedback on what this process means to really understand how zoning got us to where we are right now. 
Um, so we're working with the city to organize a panel discussion of various experts that can present um, a range of those perspectives, both um, the from the local Richmond perspective as well as the national perspective. And then also um, to have a conversation at the same time around where we move forward and how we move forward from here. We also anticipate as part of that conversation and, and panel discussion um, that there will be some sort of an open house and interactive engagement opportunity where we can ask some very early stage questions um, around visioning for the zoning ordinance. So participants will be able to, to provide some feedback um, in that earlier stage. Our second touch point, which focuses around the draft pattern book and zoning ordinance and district frameworks would be for the July, August timeframe. We're planning for a larger, more interactive public meeting, open house or workshop design um, to try to get feedback on those drafts. And to support that, we would also look to do um, community based pop up engagements. Um, and so working with different partners, we would look to identify different opportunities to again, take that workshop information and be able to bring it out to the street, bring it out to the people, particularly folks who just might not come out to a workshop um, or open house um, to try to get as much feedback as possible and to try to educate as many people as possible about this process. And then touch point three is going to be later in the year um, in the fall, and that's really focused on um, the revised ordinance, the district frameworks and the draft changes to the existing ordinance. And so we expect that's going to be a mix of activities, including a more formal public meeting um, to present the selected metrics from that process, um, sharing summary results from the prior engagement efforts and probably another public meeting or open house style event um, to share the revised pattern book and solicit feedback. Um, the one thing I do want to emphasize with all these events and particularly these larger public meetings, um, we at Brick and Story don't really believe in the traditional framework of public meetings. We think that they are often um, often inaccessible for most people um, and often designed in ways that only allow a few people to really participate and contribute to the conversation. So we are quite intentional about how we design those. We've got some examples that we're happy to share with the committee at some point later in the process, but we are very intentional about trying to design these um, these opportunities for engagement so that everyone feels welcome and that we are creating the spaces where anyone who would like to engage um, has the ability to do so in a way that's accessible for them. And then phase five, um, development of the draft and final zoning, zoning ordinance, which is really the last haul of this project and the longest haul of this project. Um, so we are going to basically do a review and reset of our engagement strategy in the fall once we've gotten through the first um, four phases. Um, the purpose of that is, is those of you who, are, who do engage and work in your own communities know, um, you often have to see what sticks, what doesn't, and then pivot accordingly. And then also understand what we need from this next phase. So we'll be revisiting the engagement strategy um, to plan what that November 24 to January 26 period looks like. We provided some examples of just some of the tools in our very diverse toolkit um, that we might actually deploy, which can include webinars and focus groups, stakeholder interviews, code hack session, surveys, visioning open houses, interviews. Um, we have a range of tools also not listed here. So again, the goal would be to really define what the goal is of phase five, what we want to achieve, what's going to be the most useful in particular for the technical members of our team um, to be able to deliver a final product. And then how can we design an engagement um, strategy that that speaks to those needs? And you see on the right hand side of the slide, potential engagement themes um, that we're considering. But again, none of these are set in stone um, and we will have plenty of time between now and the fall to actually shape out what the next phase of engagement looks like. So upcoming events, and this is um, again what someone had asked about earlier. Um, these are already on the um, the website that the city has set up for this project. So um, if you um, forget this information, don't have a chance to write it down quickly, it is already on the website. Um, there will be two webinars um, specifically focused on the basics of zoning. What is it? What does it do? Um, and those are scheduled for lunchtime, 1130 on Monday, June 24th, and then the evening, Tuesday, June 25th. They will all be recorded. Um, and as Marianne mentioned, we're talking about what the best tool is to use in order to also ensure that we're getting um, able to get as many different people to participate as possible. And then the panel discussion, which we've dubbed looking back and moving forward, um, is scheduled for Thursday, um, July 11th, 6 to 8 um, at VCU. Um, and that will, I believe we're also looking for a hybrid option for that as well. So again, for folks who can't come in person, there's an option to participate virtually in that conversation. 
And this is the website. If you've not visited already, rva.gov um, slash code refresh, um, that will take you to all of the basic information that we have about the project. You probably will all see your names on that site as well now that you're on the committee, because I believe there's a section specifically for this committee on that site. And more about this project will get updated um, and we'll continue to work with the say to update that um, as we move forward. So with that, I am going to stop sharing on my end. I'm going to turn this over to um, Emily and Manishka and Renee. Um, Manishka is going to share her screen. We have an interactive mural board for tonight's mm -hmm. purposes. You will not be interacting directly with the mural board. We are going to use it more as, as a illustrative vehicle, um, but we're going to use it also to facilitate our questions and discussion. Emily will walk us through the questions this evening with Renee. Um, again, speaking specifically to some of the points that Renee raised around the existing zoning and the existing fabric of Richmond. Um, and then from the engagement standpoint, stakeholder mapping, looking at who we've mapped in the universe and who might be missing. So with that, I will turn it over to the rest of the team. Thank you so much, Latoya. Um, so like Latoya said, um, we've been in the midst of collecting information, uh, putting our heads together and figuring out what, what we already know um, about Richmond. And, and for tonight's purposes, that's specifically going to look like um, a stakeholder map. Uh, so like Latoya said, we know that Richmond 300 was a successful process. We also know that there were some groups that were underrepresented in the Richmond 300 process. Uh, so for the code refresh, we are deliberately investing in outreach to those identified groups. Um, as part of this work, we'd like to share a, a list of organizational partners that have come up, come up through conversations with city agencies and also through our own research. Um, we want, first of all, to get it in front of your eyes and see if you've got any feedback and also to hear if you have any additional partners that might be useful as we continue on in this process. Now, the first thing I'll say before Manishka shares her screen, this is, does not need to be an exhaustive list. Uh, this just helps us to understand, especially at this stage in the process, uh, who are the folks who we should be planning alongside, what organizations and what work should we be elevating, um, and who can help us to broadcast future engagement opportunities. Um, okay, that being said, I'm going to have Manishka share her screen and we're going to take a look at our stakeholder map. Um, okay, just one second. Can you see my screen? I don't think you can. No, we can't. Um, I don't think it's letting me share my screen. Manishka, I can share from this and then you can facilitate from the mural. So give me one second, I'll share. Thanks, guys. OK, if you're not already familiar with Mural, it's an online whiteboard, essentially. Um, and you can see for the purposes of tonight, we've got a couple of different sections. We're going to start um, by looking at our stakeholder map. Um, so again, these are the groups that you saw in Latoya's presentation, the groups that came about uh, through conversation that were underrepresented in the Richmond 300 process. We've sat down, talked with city agencies, done our own research, and have uh, identified a few organizations for each identified group that might be important partners. What we'd like to do now is have you take a look at, let's start with just the 8th and 9th district residents and let's start with Hispanic and Latinx residents. So if we could zoom in there, not sure how big it is on your screen. Small. <laughs> Small, yeah, really that's what I anticipated. Um, so we'll start Is that here. better? Yeah. Okay, that's great. Um, <coughs> I'll, I'll pause for a moment so you can take a, take a second to look and you'll also notice there are some empty sticky notes. We'll start adding organizations as you call them out. Can you see them just a little bit more? I think a couple of commissioners are important. Just do, let's just do one of them, like eight and nine. Yeah. That's, yeah. Good. That's good. Thank you. Okay. Great. So we're taking a moment to look at these organizations and give us any feedback. Um, and also if there are other organizations, knowing that we're based in DC, you're based in Richmond, you're the local experts, who are we missing here? 
This is Maritza. One of the there are neighborhood civic associations in eight and nine. They're not as they're they don't meet as often and maybe don't as much. So I think you'd have to kind of drill down into the ones that are kind of more firm and they meet often and then try and identify the places where there's the holes, like what resources are available there. It's just a, that's part of the reason why it's often challenging to reach eighth and ninth is because the civic infrastructure isn't the same as it is in the other parts of the city. Um, this is Eric Mai. Um, I'd recommend Virginia Community Voice. Um, they're led by Leo Whitehurst Gibson. They're a nonprofit. They do organizing um, down in the eighth and ninth. Okay. Thank you for both those comments. This is Shanice. I would also recommend that you revisit Richmond Connects. They did an immense amount of um, community outreach to different underserved communities as well. Thank you. I'd be, Janina, I'd be interested in hearing like how with the, that we always will be like churches, reach out to churches, but then it's like which ones and how I think ends up being a big question. I would say, well, definitely we're in, um, in the ninth district, also second Baptist um, in the ninth district is another that I would encourage. Um, another would be Swanboro Boys and Girls Club um, that is um, currently servicing uh, students. And it's Second Baptist Church uh, under churches um, to, to reach out to. There's obviously going to be some overlap. This is Charlie Wilson, mm -hmm. um, you're online. It's obviously going to be some overlap too in the South Side, particular. Like there are parts of the Fourth District that are like white and affluent, and then there are other parts of the, the Fourth District that are distinctly not that. Um, I'm wondering if, if we're going to defer that engagement to other parts of this chart or if that's something that has already been addressed somewhere else and I'm just not aware of it yet. Let's take a let's walk through it and then if it's still missing while we get when we get to the end of it, make a note for us um, and we can have a, a conversation about it. This is Benny Gates. I would um, also add Virginia organizing because they do a whole lot of things in the housing in particularly the ninth district. And they, they're always meeting, and that's a good organization. And this is Casey. My apologies if I missed it, but I know Eric mentioned Virginia Community Voice. I just want to make sure they got on there because they were going to be my recommendation oh. as well. Thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. For now, I'm going to move us on to the next to the next group. Um, Hispanic and Latinx residents. They were identified as an underrepresented group in Richmond 300. So this time we want to make a real concerted effort. Here are the organizations we've heard about thus far. Who is missing? Um, yeah, this is Shanice. I would say maybe the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. They use a lot of um, community members to do a lot of outreach, and they do a really good job. Great. Thank you. Um, I, I'd recommend, this is Eric, I'd recommend a particular business owner, uh, Martin Gonzalez with La Milpa. Um, he's a prominent voice in the and, business community. And he's technically in Chesterfield, but and he helps run like a Latino farmer's market, which is also in Chesterfield, but you might hit um, Latino residents who are Richmonders um, in Chesterfield. Yeah, he has a lot of other connections to other businesses throughout the city too, so. Could you repeat the name of his business again? La Milpa. La Milpa? Okay, thank you. Hi, this is Yanina. I would also recommend, uh, kind of goes along with the ninth district, but also would help with the Hispanic residents, would be another church called La Roca Church. Um, they are very vibrant and also are a feed more site for the ninth district, so I would recommend them. Um, also, um, I believe it's the Southwood 
community. So they're not necessarily an organization, but it's the largest uh, Hispanic neighborhood in Southside. Um, it's probably 1,200 units in Southwood. So it's a large Hispanic community that you could get uh, feedback. This is Shanice. You also could contact um, Woodruff Consulting, Felicia Woodruff. She has a lot of insight and influence with the Hispanic population as well. And she does a lot of work in Southwood that can correlate with everyone else. Too. Um, can you repeat the name again, please? So uh, Felicia Woodruff and it's Woodruff Consulting. Okay, I hear a pause, so I'm going to move us to the next group. I, I actually want to add a couple more. Yeah. Uh, oh, go ahead. The um, I think it's called Celebration now, but it used to be the Rock. That church, they do a whole lot of things with the Hispanic community. Liberation. Liberation. Yeah, I keep changing that. Liberation now. Liberation Church. And and also the um, Virginia Virginia Community Health Workers Association. They do a whole lot of things with the Spanish community through us. Gene Community Health Workers Association. Health. 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 H-E-L-T-H. Health. 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 Workers Association. Sorry. I'm sorry. Gene Community Health Workers Association. Sorry, it's a big room and the mic doesn't pick up all the nuances okay. of what y'all are saying. So bear with us. We appreciate it. And there's okay. the, um, one more church, I'm sorry, that uh, they provide dinners to the community, and a lot of Hispanics, um, families come out to that, and that church is on Jank Road, and it is, um, I can't even name the church right now, we'll come back to that. Presswood, Presswood Presbyterian Church. Presswood? Presswood. With a C. Yep. Yeah, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. C R E S T would. Okay, we're going to move to the next group for the sake of time. Um, we sat down with DC agencies and, and got a lot of good organizations that are supporting immigrant communities in Richmond. Here are a few that we heard about. Um, once again, who is missing? Uh, this is Eric. Um, I might include Virginia Poverty Law Center or Central Virginia Legal Aid Society. Poverty Law? That's Legal Aid. Society. I think we've got a really good point of contact at the city for immigrant communities. So I'm going to move us to the next one. I feel pretty confident about our outreach there. Uh, what about low income residents? What organizations are supporting low income residents in Richmond? Feed more. Um, Virginia supported housing. I'll take it. Urban Hope. <laughs> what was that? Sorry. Ur Urban Hope. Okay. 
This is Shanice. I think you should include some grassroots organizations in there because of the power of their relatability. But we'll be here all night with that list, so maybe I can submit it to you. I can email it to you separately. I think that some grassroots organizations will be some good plugins right there. They have a lot of relatability. The community trusts them, and I think that will be like an awesome thing to do. Yes, that's a wonderful. Um, that's wonderful. What I'm going to do on one of these sticky notes, the great idea, and I should have thought of it, is I'm going to write my email address in case you have any. Capital uh, area uh, health education. Hey, Emily, maybe what we could do to make it easier is we have a staff point of contact with the yeah. city that can collect all of the information right. and right. um, facilitate it over, get it over to you. If that's okay, Marianne. Yeah. yeah. Great. Marianne, before we conclude, if you could just get out some contact information for who that appropriate person was, city staff. Yeah. Another organization you can add on there is SCAN. They've introduced a new resilience program in their um, organization, and they have been doing a lot of things for um, low income families and communities. Uh, can you repeat that? that yeah, was that STAIN? Stan, C, I mean, S C A N. Is that how you spell it? Is that S T? No, without it's, just, e. it's, a, it's an abbreviation. Yeah. So S C A N. S C A N. Okay. And you also can include um, BDH, Richmond Henrico Health District. They do a whole lot of stuff for low income communities. And what was the acronym again? RHHD. RHHD. Thank you. This is the Area Health Education Center. Say that one more time. Capital. Capital. Area Health Education Center. Capital Area Health Education Center. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. This is Wayne Prado. Another organization is called Homework. Homework actually has a street sheet list of many different organizations um, that they give out to different residents in Richmond to help them in need. And so that may be helpful as far as that list as well. Wonderful. Thank you. Just shout out two more. <laughs> Uh, the Partnership for Housing Affordability, or PHA, we have a housing resource line. And then the second one is the Neighborhood Resource Center of Greater Fulton, or just NRC. And then there's like the YMCA and the YWCA, and even our own Parks and Rec Department does a lot of outreach to low-income communities. Salvation Army. And then there's a church called Faith in God Ministry. They also do they provide food and assistance to low income residents outside. With just one ministry, yeah. There's a Faith in God Ministry, but that's their I'm going to move us to our last identified group, which is young people, I think. Yeah, okay. Um, young people. But have a young foundation. I would, I don't know if UVA, UVA yeah. is kind of far away from here. Maybe replace that with Virginia Union. Yeah, maybe VUU. And there was something else that someone had said before that I don't think we quite caught. It's called the Forever Young Foundation. Thank you. University of Richmond. University of Richmond. There are others. All of the boys and girls. Yeah. I mean, I'd be curious. 
stuff. You guys worked in UVA um, in Charlottesville. Like there's a whole transient student population who are, I mean, a lot of people do stay. We know, I see a lot of VCU grads here with me and U of R and stuff, but how do you manage, how did you guys message to a, or did you try and reach like a, a big student population that are like moving on right after they graduate? I'm sorry, that's a question for the consulting team. Yeah, just wondering how, okay. how you how you message to the yeah. university. Yeah, so in the case of the Seville Plans Together effort, um, we, so if you remember at the beginning of the presentation, I mentioned something we're looking at as a community ambassador model. Um, we had a similar model set up for the Seville Plans Together effort, and one of our community ambassadors um, actually ended up being a UVA planning student. Um, and the project went on long enough where he joined us as an ambassador in his freshman year and went through all four years of undergrad as an ambassador. And so what that actually allowed us to do was um, leverage him as well as some other faculty at UVA um, to actually do outreach to UVA students. Um, and we talked to a number of students. Um, I, I would say a lot of the students who lived within the neighborhoods we were able to connect with at a variety of other events off campus or even going door to door in the neighborhoods um, because there were, I think to your point, there's quite a few students who, uh, while some are transient, many end up deciding, particularly the grad students, end up deciding to stay on long time, long term. Um, so again, kind of depending on the demographic, um, I think particularly with the grad students, some of the housing concerns that were raised as part of Seville Plans Together were, were very pertinent to them as they were trying to make longer term um, life decisions about where they were going to stay, what they could afford, what was going to be available to them from a housing opportunity and economic development opportunity as well. Do we have the YW in Wyoming? Oh, we also on the previous Peter Paul development thing. Oh yeah, for low income. There's another exactly. service yeah. coming out of youth there too. Oh, youth, yes, Peter yeah, Paul, absolutely. So Peter absolutely. Paul development is finished. Okay. Um, in the Highland Park neighborhood, uh, there's Six Points Innovation Center. Six Points Innovation Center. Hey, Emily and team. I don't, these are all really great, and I don't want to rush this, but we do have 30 minutes, and I don't know um, how much more beyond here that you have. So I want to make sure we get a little bit of each group and then maybe Marianne, we could get an email out from staff just as a reminder that if you think of others that fall within these categories, we can follow up because I just don't want to run out of time and, and miss any further discussion points that you wanted to hit. Sure, that was actually, that's the, this is the last group. So um, good point, well-timed. Um, I'm sorry for what you, I'm sorry, it's really big. If you want to get to the eighth and ninth district. Southside Community Which, Development. Southside Community Development Center. Well, thank you so much for those thoughts. Um, we know it is getting into the weeds and we appreciate you taking some time to think about it with us uh, because we know we're not the local experts. We wanted to ask you all the local experts while we have you on a call. What we'll be doing next is creating a master list of folks that we know we want to engage in contact information so we can start broadcasting future engagement opportunities to very specific folks. We'll also be doing some stakeholder interviews, so this is a useful list as we start compiling folks to interview. Um, we're going to transition back to Renee, who has some questions for y'all um, specifically related to the code refresh process. Thank you, Emily. So um, yeah, it's always it's always a little bit awkward to do this online, and um, but looking forward to working with you guys in person in future meetings. Um, and uh, really excited to to yeah to be engaged with you guys for the next year. So we wanted to just start with a few like really high level questions. So we've gone from the very specific all the way up to the very top here. Um, but we'd like to just throw out a few of these questions to you guys, and these are the same or similar questions to the ones that we posed to staff at the planning commission when we first came in. Um, when we meet with you next in person, we'll be getting uh, down to much more detailed questions about specific things, and we'll be presenting some of the initial work that we've done. But just to kind of get things going, I wanted to kind of throw out a couple high-level questions to you, and I also want to make sure that you've got uh, that we've got time remaining for you guys to ask questions to us as well too. So 
Um, maybe just to start us off, and we can maybe you know, go through these quickly, or we can combine them just to make sure we've got enough time. But very broadly, um, are there are new buildings in Richmond generally reflective of of what you want to see? Why or why not? So, incredibly broad question, but we'd just like to hear your take. There's a lot of new development happening in the city. Um, what's your what's your 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 what's your take on it? I would throw that open to anybody on the on the council. This is Dave Johanna speaking. Um, I'm concerned about some of the construction that's going on in terms of the the scale. I'm not concerned about the scale of the block as much as the actual architecture that's going in. And um, I'd like to see a little more quality control in terms of what's being built. And I'm also concerned about about um, developing in the historic districts and uh, coming up with a strong philosophy about what we want to see in those in historic districts. That's all great points. Um, anybody else want to jump in? Um, there, there's some residential development that just feels like a missed opportunity from like uh, they could have done more housing there, whether they do it or not. A lot of like this property zoned R5, someone buys the lot, they just want to build a house there, but it was, you know, it was zoned, zoned in a way and transferred in a way that in reality they could have done two houses there, they just didn't know it. So a lot of missed opportunities from a uh, developer, home builder, even homeowner building a house, uh, just not knowing what they're sitting on um, and then proceeding to put time, energy, resources into building something that could have been more. Um, a lot of that just walking around that, that I see. Mm -hmm. This is Roger York. Uh, the existing ordinance simply doesn't have the teeth in it to be able to do very much and for all practical purposes, it's pretty much up to the developer to do whatever they want to. Sometimes we get lucky, and more often than not, we are not lucky. So there's a, it's, I would say that, you know, I'm not going to use the kind of language that I feel like using, but there's clearly a need to create a sort of thing that you obviously are already geared towards trying to provide for us, but it's completely lacking. This is Benny Gates. I want to add um, my concern with the animals in the trees that have been demolished and um, the animals are all in our neighborhoods now that weren't there before. Um, I like the development, but sometimes you can just take a place that's kind of abandoned and renovate rather than just keep cutting down all the trees because it's, it's creating a, um, the, the environment, everything is going when you cut down all the trees. There's no trees to replace it. There's a bunch of buildings getting higher and higher. Yeah, urban tree canopy for sure. Preston Lloyd, um, I'm going to mm -hmm. take a slightly different take on this question, and I'm going to say that I'm not seeing a lot of the housing built in the city that I'd like to see, and so it, it's more our buildings being built generally reflective. I think that we have a tremendous need for additional housing, and due to some regulatory impediments that make it challenging for that housing to be constructed, that's not happening, notwithstanding the huge demand. So I think that's going to be a big part of our conversation as a. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's not only what's being built, but it's what what's it's what's not being built. I want to yes. add also, I'm sorry, affordable housing. Is it really affordable when you're looking at the um, incomes and in these houses? That, I mean, I've seen apartments, <coughs> hundred dollars for two bedroom apartments, and you're working at like McDonald's or something. There's no. This is Roger York again. One more thing, uh, as far as affordability is concerned, the mindset in Richmond is so conservative that new construction has to look a certain way, and it's not. It doesn't take into consideration the tremendous opportunities for different uh, building materials and and techniques that people in Richmond probably are going to have an awfully difficult time adjusting to. That's the only way that housing prices are going to be able to be brought down. Start thinking outside the box. Mm -hmm. um, anybody else want to say anything about how they feel about recent developments in Richmond? This is Dave Johannes again. Uh, another thing I think really other people have already alluded to this the range in housing product is pretty limited here. Mm -hmm. 
to one side of do, do you want to say a little bit more about that? Sure. Um, we don't have opportunities what? for purchasable properties. Part of the reason might be that we're not doing enough, um, let's say, in multifamily housing that is purchasable condominiums. Uh, so we're not promoting that. We're and there, there are financial uh, impediments involved in that, and maybe we can do something about it. Um, also, filling the entire place up with five-story multifamily is. Um, limiting the other opportunities for other types of housing and whether it's attached housing or multiple attached housing and also we are leaving that we're we're abandoning our abandoning our alleys which is a really prominent location where we could be putting housing in at small small scale and having almost no impact on the city or uh, city neighborhoods in terms of scale and character. Infill has in fronting on the alleys, yeah. Yeah, but, mm -hmm. yeah, there's a huge disparity also in the zone, current zoning as it relates to the land mass that is restricted yeah. to single family, some maybe duplex, but, and then there's a real disparity where uh, zoning allows more multifamily housing that is very reflective of some of the other challenges that it costs from that having, uh, you know, this this old city thing of west of the boulevard and that's changed drastically. I think we moved the boundaries a lot farther east, um, but certainly there's huge disparity as it relates to opportunities for more multifamily housing or more dense housing development opportunities. I just want to say something real quick, not to take it up. I think that question seems like our new buildings in Richmond generally reflective of what you want. I think it should be like reflective of what the purpose is, meaning like are we talking about the community? Are we talking about developing because develop development, but one of the biggest problems that we have in Richmond with new deals is it seems like it's not affordable to build it. So it creates like a big gap in, I guess, equitable housing, even affordable housing. Like people cannot afford the, the new development. It's out of their reach with the income that they have. And so I think when you ask that question, you have to ask like, is it what you want to see based off of who you're trying to serve or who? you are addressing because I may say like we don't have affordable housing but a developer may say well you know we're developing every day because it's 30 people that are added to some I think that question should be asked towards like what who are you trying to serve and what is it that you're trying to do with zoning because some yeah. of our zoning creates like a lot of gentrification amongst other things and I don't want to take up nobody's time I'm just saying like when you're asking that question I think it needs to be like focus in on exactly who is it that you're trying to serve or what population is looking at the buildings. Sure, I understand. I mean, I'm just asking you guys personally right now, and we'll certainly be you know engaging lots of other people you know as we go through this project in terms of the public and different stakeholder groups. So, um, but yeah, certainly understood that affordability, you know, a big problem in Richmond. And that, that's well, like the people that live in the hotels, which is so many families now, which is ridiculous. Imagine so many families who live in hotels. When they do say there's new affordable housing coming, they go to apply and they, they feel and realize they can't afford it. So it's like depressing, you know. So it makes them sometimes go to things they probably wouldn't want to do because they, it's, it's, not, it's not affordable. Um, yeah, this is Damian Pitt. A couple of points that are, I think, already well documented here in Richmond. But, but one is the Lack of uh, we'll missing middle housing that's that's being built, and including in neighborhoods, our historic neighborhoods like the Fan and the Museum District, that um, developed with a variety of um, you know attached housing styles and and small apartment four eight flexes and so forth, uh, much of which is not allowed in the current zoning. And we're seeing in the Museum District at least we're seeing large corner lots getting infilled, which is good, but they're infilled with massive townhomes. Um, where there's an opportunity, you know, there's a lost opportunity for 
you know, those are properties that could have been four or eight, you know, housing units and are being built as one or two massive, you know, multi-million dollar homes or uh, million dollar homes. And another issue is that I, th I think it's good that we're seeing a lot of new um, multifamily being built. Point, points have been made about the price point <laughs> being being an issue, which, which I acknowledge. Another issue is that a lot of it's being built for, for um, you know, young professionals, and it's it's a lot of like one bedrooms, and we're not seeing new housing being built that's in the that's kind of family oriented in terms of being you know, three or four bedroom units, and, and that's something that we need as well. This um, is oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. This is Wayne Cradle. Um, from what I see, there is a lot of housing that's being developed. I'm interested in the grocery stores. Um, there's a lack of grocery stores, in a sense, uh, depending upon where you live, depending upon your zip code, there is a, a disparity. You have some, you have many uh, residents who they're traveling over 10 miles just to get a, just to get some bread. And so I'm interested in what that would look like. Some more, maybe more commercial uses into the interior of neighborhoods, yeah. Renee. Um, this is Elizabeth. Um, yeah. I'm not trying to stop conversation. Let's, let's, let's keep let's keep let's keep moving down. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think I think a lot of these questions actually kind of overlap with each other, so I think it's fine that we took a while on that. Okay. Um, I think uh, you know I think all of it, some of this you know we've already covered, but let's let's ask you guys, um, what are your top priorities for the new code? So you know if there was you know one big issue that you really wanted this new code to address, um, easy to use. But affordability. <laughs> I would say That's easy like to one. use. Yeah. Renee, easy to use. Yeah, so so you don't have to hire land use attorneys. Yeah. <laughs> I think you, you opened the presentation, Renee, with we need to modernize the zoning ordinance. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, so we're not so reliant on the SUP process. Sorry, Preston and Jennifer. Um, but I think that is something that's actually key. Yeah, in this process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sounds good. Uh, Any top there. priorities? Uh, you know, to Maritza's point about easy to use, um, you know, that point, it's not just for developers and builders, but that's for um, everyday Richmonders as well. Um, everyone in the city should be able to understand the zoning ordinance, and what it means, what it does, um, because it affects, um, it affects them. So, yeah, absolutely. That's what we love to hear. Um, this is Charlie Wilson. Uh, I interact with the zoning ordinance four or five times a day, at least. Um, and I also do other localities. In Rico County next door has a splashy new zoning ordinance, but I I feel really stupid reading it. Like you need a PhD to understand that thing. And again, they, they've thought about every last thing you could possibly think about. And if you're like a zoning wizard, then it's probably awesome, right? But I, I think the city should harness its reality is like an organic urban fabric and while it's fun to think about different scenarios and try to codify it i think it's also nice to think about just our organic development pattern and how we have to just kind of accept we live in a city and things are going to get built and we can't always design it to the nth degree while there is some validity to form-based code for sure but i like a lot of it i just want to, it's a careful line to walk i guess so, yeah in terms of flexibility and for sure okay. yeah this is Roger York, and uh, of course, simplicity and flexibility often are very hard to achieve at the same time. Because uh, I ultimately end up sometimes the Board of Zoning Appeals ultimately determines appeals of decisions, and so for me, wordsmithing is extremely important. And no Oxford commas <laughs> that's gotten us a lot of trouble. In the ordinance is a mess now because it's 50 years ago it made sense, but instead of rewriting it, it's just been amended, 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 yeah, amended. For sure. Yeah. And it's it's a it's turned it into an absolute nightmare. It's a patchwork for sure. I would add crime um, concerns um, sometimes with certain zones and certain areas it's crime is elevated because certain things are allowed. Maybe make sure we can try to. Minimize mm -hmm. uh, to, to that point. Mm -hmm. Sorry, we're not, yeah, we're not in the public comment period. Thank you. 
Uh, this is Dave Johannes again, um, speaking about uh, construction and zoning and make them kind of meld together. Right now we have a zoning ordinance with height limits and the height limits don't allow us to put in, let's say, 10 foot ceilings for residential uses or decent size uh, ceiling heights for the commercial first floors. So managing uh, basic land use and limits in terms of what you need to do to build and provide decent products. So, so aligning the, the height maximums of stories with those in feet. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, probably a uh, major one. Um, we've, if we've got to kind of keep moving through this, but any other final kind of top priorities anybody wants to? Yeah, the, the, this is Philip Hart and picking up on something that Roger said. I've observed that the planning staff really does not have the power to deal with design issues. So I would like to um, see us explore design overlay districts and other kinds of controls, controls or influences, or maybe that's what this pattern book is, is all about. But I think that that should be explored as part of this process. And I think uh -huh. we need to look at design restrictions and how much that impact costs. Mm -hmm. yep. uh -huh. I, this is, goes more into like the mapping of where the code gets Put, but our new code, when it's mapped, needs to create opportunities for different types of housing throughout the whole city. Just, I think, getting to what the comment you were making, Councilwoman Robertson. Um, we're going to touch on mapping. Uh, I'd like to see uh, more activity in our alleys uh, and the ability to build in our alleys. Um, Walk form in general. I'd like to think about what our streetscapes are going to be like as we, and we've done a little bit that on that in the like the BRT plans. Um, strong focus on what do I have here? Uh, transit stops. So uh, meld together our transit and our development areas in terms of the our mapping. And uh, what can we do to provide more opportunity for affordable housing and also look at relationships for uh, more green trees, plants? Mm -hmm. And I think we also need to look at the fact that there are some zoning in the city that is, you can't find it, but in certain neighborhoods, period. And every neighborhood, so example, when we, have been challenged with shelters. Uh, we, are, we are restricted. First of all, we didn't have an opportunity for shelter zoning, period. Um, we've made some changes in that, but every neighborhood should have an opportunity for any use that we find, a land use that we want to see in the city of Richmond. Every neighborhood should have an opportunity to do such a development without having to go through a special use permit. This is Preston Lloyd. Again, one of the motivating animuses of this group being convened is the recommended big move that came out of the Richmond 300 plan. And page 210 of that plan summarizes the key benefits that were expected from rewriting the zoning ordinance. And so it spells out a number of the things that we've outlined, but just to highlight a few briefly, it's to move from Euclidean zoning to form-based zoning, Prepare for opportunity, which we've discussed. It's talking about density and, and focusing on nodes, as is described in the plan. Rethinking the B3 district, improving health resiliency and access, and expanding options. Namely, the rewrite of the zoning ordinance should include examining commercial zoning districts to make sure they provide housing options at various price points. So this aligns with a lot of the comments that have been made, but I just wanted to make sure that we tied it back to that recommendation out of the Richmond 300 plan. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Richmond 300 will be our you know number one point of guidance as we as we go into this. So. Um, OK, should we just go to the last couple of questions here just for a yeah, second? I think we're, we are starting to run low on time, yeah. so, so maybe. Uh, I don't want to create a big exercise for the group, but I do. This is our first meeting. We're taking a lot in. I think we should be given the opportunity to maybe send some additional comments to get them over to you within a certain period of time so sure. that we're not overlooking organizations or other work points. Sure. Yeah, what I'm planning to do. 
I'm just going to hop in because I think I might have a solution here. Um, I'm going to type this up into an Excel spreadsheet. So we've just got a running list of everything we heard. Um, and I can share that out and then you can add comments as you see fit. So we're not pinched for time here. That would be great. Again, we'll be talking to you guys lots more. There's a deadline so. for that too, um, so that we people know when they need to respond. Um, we don't want to hold your timeline up. Oh, we'll, that will follow up with an email. We like Richmond's right under where we get homework and deadlines. Great. This surveys. Thank you. All right, Renee, you want to? Yeah, so I think I, I I mostly wanted to, if we're not going to get through all these questions, and again, they, they do kind of overlap with each other, so I don't think that, I think we, we've heard some of your biggest priorities already. Um, I mostly would like to just make sure you guys have an opportunity to ask us any questions you may have before we wrap up today. So um, can I maybe just open the floor to, to that? We've got just a few more minutes left. Um, this is Eric, I guess. I would have a question to you about any lessons learned from the Charlottesville rewrite that you could impart to us. That was my question, Eric. Sorry. <laughs> I might want to put that over to I know, Latoya. Do you want to do you want to say anything about that? I actually was not personally on that project, although it was done by our firm. So. Um, that's actually so. It's the one challenge there, I can speak to the engagement piece, but not yeah. in detail on the zoning piece. I would probably suggest that that's actually a question that we we'll probably need lead for, to be honest with you, because Lee was kind of the prime on that one mm -hmm. from Code Studio. Um, I think you're asking from the technical standpoint, correct? Both. Both. So, I mean, I'll speak from the engagement standpoint. Um, the the primary difference with this process is uh, you had kind of you had Richmond 300 part one, which is a very large part one, um, you know, around your comp plan. Um, in the case of, and there was a gap and a bit of a, a break, and then starting the zoning code. Um, in the case of Seville Plan Together, it was a, a bit of a package deal. It took four years, but a bit of a package deal um, where we started with. The comp plan, affordable housing strategy, and then moved into the zoning code. So, by the time we were doing engagement around the zoning code update, we had, and so I say similar to Richmond 300, we had we had built up a bit of foundation through the comp plan process. Um, I think that's one of the great things about the success that you had from Richmond 300 is that we are, um, we're not necessarily reinventing the wheel in terms of talking to people about the built environment, the changes that need to happen and in the, the city processes and legal processes that need to happen for those changes to occur. Um, you know, I think the other thing from an engagement standpoint, um, and I mentioned this because broadly in our presentation for how we think about working with folks um, in communities and particularly with a topic like zoning is thinking through, and this is really a big part of our job of working with Code Studio, is how we're just making that information as accessible as possible because zoning of all of the many things in design, construction, land use, zoning is probably one of the least accessible aspects of it um, for anyone who does not work in this space every day. Um, and so I think that's that's one of the key things that I think Seville Plans Together tried to do and I think did pretty successfully and that we'd want to impart here as well as thinking through how we're translate that, translating that information and really getting folks to understand what, what zoning is going to do, what um, we need to hear from people in order to help inform what that new zoning code looks like. Um, and then again, kind of creating those spaces for folks to be able to provide that feedback. Yeah, I apologize. If we want to have another conversation later about Charlottesville, I'm, I'm happy to bring um, Lee Einswey, our other partner who was involved in leading that project into it. Um, but I think just generally speaking, I think we're really happy with the end product of Charlottesville, which is a really sort of clean graphic um, code that's easy to follow as opposed to the sort of very confusing uh, uh, code that they had before. Um, and also it was a product that, that really closely followed on a comprehensive plan. So a bit similar to this that so um, it's it's a, you know, a good demonstration of the planning process, which you know should begin with a comprehensive plan and then proceed to a code that then implements that plan. I ask one more question. Has a decision been made, this is Roger Moore, about whether to try to take 
a lot of the current districts and reform them in a direction to better achieve what we're talking about here, or to give up on them and create new districts. Because if you create new districts, then you have to match them. And that's another whole long drawn out ball game. Has any thought been given to about which directions go on? I mean, I think that you know it depends what you call the process. I mean, I think certainly it's going to be it's going to be a substantial reform, whether whether we say it's it's you know taking some districts and amending them and combining districts together, or it's about throwing them out and beginning with new ones. It's potentially the, those are not that different of a thing. Um, I think that there's there will certain, be substantial a changes. There's a certain line after which it's going to be considered a change that requires notice and a new mapping. So some decisions are going to have to be made. You might see some. Of them. I'm sure. That's well. exactly what I'm talking about. Not in this area, but that's that's kind of a, that's probably something that ought to be given a lot of thought because the the impact is going to be a lot sooner if it could be done within the structure of the, the current ordinance. If not, the last time we did this took four years to remap the zoning ordinance. What? After the after the ordinance was once you adopt a new ordinance, it doesn't do anything. You have to map it. And that's another whole process where you have to go out of neighborhoods. I went to hundreds and hundreds of neighborhood meetings going through the process. And it took four years the last time we did. So that's a pretty important consideration. Yeah, no, certainly understood. I was just going to share a little bit. I know Sovereign kind of talks about uh, kind of there might be some sort of changes done this year, looking at those changes would likely not be mapping changes or fixing mm -hmm. some of the districts to allow things to occur that are um, the match the character and the form that are there. That's what we're looking to get done this year. Um, next year, also part of kind of why we're going to look again at the engagement and what we're doing, there might be more um, change in the strategy. There might be mapping related to the work that's going to be done um, after the fall of this year. This is Kendra. Um, I know we had, and I know you're sending out the list of organizations for outreach and engagement. Historically, a lot of those organizations have been involved with city processes and have still led to some of the like uh, disparities that we see across the different uh, communities. And so I am a little hesitant with focusing on a lot of the organizations that the city has historically worked with to do some of this outreach, knowing that that hasn't brought what we would like to see um, in, in previous planning sessions. So I just kind of wanted to uplift that a little bit because I saw a lot of organizations that we use for RBA Green 2050 and a lot of organizations that we use for Richmond 300, which still led to some of these um, issues that we're trying to improve um, in the process right now. Thank you for flagging that. And, and the one thing we can do with the spreadsheet that um, Emily will share um, with Marianne and Marianne can distribute to the rest of the committee. We can put in you know, a comment section, but I think any particular groups that you think are worth highlighting um, where you feel they've not necessarily been at the table for regular engagement. I think whatever whatever qualifiers you can give us, um, that that helps us um, also know, um, particularly if it means that even if you know if they're not even currently involved in city communications, really, that means that we might know, hey, we need to maybe make a personal call to these folks or show up at their door to actually figure out how to invite them into this process and get into their network of people. So I think whatever whatever additional context you can give us is incredibly helpful. So we just have a few minutes left um, for our consultant team. Is there any other thing that you need to get out at this point in time? I know there's going to be some follow up emails and some homework um, so that we still have the opportunity to comment on these topics going forward, but is there anything in this last minute or two? Because I want to be respectful of everyone's time. I think we've mostly happy. covered covered it, yeah. Okay. Go ahead. So um, I'm not the city attorney, but uh, at the Richmond 300 kickoff meeting, we had a member of the city attorney come and give the same admonition that I'm going to give, which is that we are not the planning commission, we're not city council, we're not elected to do anything official but we are considered a public body under Virginia state law, which means that if more than two of us talk about the zoning ordinance, whether via email or otherwise, it's considered a public meeting, that's a no-no. And second, any email that we exchange with another member is also subject or text message is subject to public disclosure, meaning if the city is asked, they have to produce any email or correspondence 
that is uh, on that topic. So you can click on your personal device. Correct. So again, just for the warning, that's those are the rules as they apply to us. Is that more than two or three? It's more than three. three. It says three. If it's, three. It's, if, yeah. if it's three, that's bad. Yeah. So yeah. Three, 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 four, three. Three. So if you can't be three people having a conversation via email, text, Facebook, probably even as well, like you can't have a conversation about the topic at all. <laughs> Not allowed. <laughs> Unless it's and if you do want to have a meeting of three or more, it's considered a public meeting and Marianne will have to notice it. But it could be that you all go to church together and you're at church together. You're not talking about this. That's fine. That's fine. You can go to church. Marianne, it may help just to have some follow up from the city attorney's office just for folks that may not be familiar with the, the FOIA and the public meeting. We can send a message out, and if there's additional questions, we could maybe have them do a quick um, update at the next meeting. Yeah. Okay. And Councilman Roberts, did you have something to add? Yeah, I just think that it would be important for us to, uh, to the best that we can, define what zoning can do uh, and what zoning is not designed to do, mm -hmm. uh, because I think. Uh, I don't want us to have expectations, and zoning has a tremendous impact on what zoning can accomplish that perhaps is not a not strictly zoning. Okay. And I think those things need to be clarified. I also have heard several comments, and affordable housing is one of my has always been a priority for me. But as we define affordable housing, it appears it, it is constant. We're constantly reminded that what we build and are building as it relates to affordable housing, it is not affordable to all people. And we, the city has adopted an ordinance to define what affordable housing is. But even in doing so, if when we talk about the peak status, you know, look, what are we trying to do to accomplish purpose and achieve missions as it relates to the populations and so forth that we want to make sure that we are serving versus what we are building and what it costs. Um, clarification as to what zoning, how zoning can help us accomplish that, but then where there are areas that is not resolved through zoning. Uh, is important and the families like living in the hotels that you spoke of and so it doesn't matter what we build for affordable housing if you're paying a certain amount of money and that's all you can afford you know the definition of what is affordable housing is important that we be clear on that as well so um i'm gonna wrap this up um, thank you to our consultants. Um, I think the next steps is they're also on the screen behind us. The next meeting, we will get some follow up from Marianne or, or staff. Um, I do know that there are some folks um, in the public, in person, and online that um, had some comments. Um, keep in mind, we will take public comment if that happens in the um, public comment period in the beginning of the meeting. So we definitely want to hear from you, but that is the appropriate time to weigh in. So if you didn't get to offer your comments um, today, there will be another opportunity at our next meeting. Marianne, are there any other um, logistical um, notes or homework that we need to announce? Or I don't think so. We'll get that email to you all. Okay. And again, the next meeting we're looking to use the plan will be a boardroom off of Hall Street. It will give us a little more um, space and ability to break out into groups. That would also allow us to do the virtual as well as have more virtual. Thanks, Ross. Sure. Uh, could I request that you send out um, just kind of an overview of Robert's rules sure. for the entire council? Thanks. You can, um, Sam, Sam and I will probably be the two main point of contact body. So if you have questions, but other members of the team will engage um, a lot more on some of the more technical matters. So if you have any questions, just reach out to me. Thank you everyone for your time. We're excited to work together and take a dive into zoning with you. And thank you, Marianne and your team and the consultants for guiding us through this. See everybody next month.
Thank you so much. See you. Thank 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 you.